Well, hey there team, welcome back to the channel, and welcome to my review of Star Wars Outlaws. So, a bit of a preface, I suppose, because I do not live in a bubble. I'm aware that there is a lot of rhetoric, a lot of back and forth controversy around this game. People are drawing battle lines and kind of making their mind up about this game before it releases. And I just want to say this to be perfectly clear. I'm not going to brush over any of that. I'll address the issues as I see them. But I am beholden to no man, no ideology, and certainly no fucking company. I'm going to, through the course of this, point out some pretty glaring negative problems with this game. And if, look, if Ubisoft wants to blacklist me for that, then so be it. But inversely, I'm also going to tell you the cool things about this game because there's a lot of that as well. In fact, would I say it's worth your time, worth your money? Yeah, absolutely. I, I do believe that. I've enjoyed my time with it. I've spent 18 hours with this game at the moment, and there's so much more left, but it doesn't actually feel bloated, which is a problem that a lot of these sort of games can have. And it's the reason that I've stopped at 18 hours. It's a soft cap. I think 18 hours is perfectly reasonable to render at least a verdict. And if I do play more and complete the game fully, I'll probably do a follow-up video in the future. But I've kind of enjoyed every second of it. There's some eye rolly cringe shit in here, right? And there are some graphical issues too. And I'm not going to bury them so much as address that I'm going to address them, but I don't want to lead with just negatives as well. There are a lot of systems and a lot of moving parts this game, and I only have so much time. So stick around, we'll get to those negatives through the course of it, but know that I think this is a really fun game, and if you fancy yourself just a random normie that enjoyed Star Wars, like the original Star Wars trilogy, and I like the prequels as well, because I, I enjoyed them when I was a kid, and I don't really watch modern Star Wars stuff, I find it all to be kind of crap, but at the same time, I enjoy enjoy pretty much all Star Wars video games. I feel that whatever you think of EA, their curatorship over the brand for the past 10 years or whatever it is, they knocked out some absolute bangers. So generally speaking, I, I don't think that's a particularly hot take. And so coming into this, my biggest point of curiosity, if anything, was, okay, yeah, let's give the license to Ubisoft, the guys who made the Assassin's Creed, Far Cry, you know, th there's a craft there, whether you think it's waned in recent years or not, but the idea of getting an open world Star Wars game under their brand should at least make you curious. And I think they nailed it for the most part, negatives notwithstanding. It had me thinking, and I had to Google it and look it up because I haven't thought about it in years, about 1313. Maybe you're a younger guy and you don't remember it, but that was a previous previously cancelled kind of hand solo simulator sort of game that was really hyped but then for whatever reason didn't make it to the light of day. In fact that's a good way of putting what this game is. This is a hand solo simulator and all the little sort of moving parts under the hood synergize really well. I like a lot of the mini games. It doesn't lean heavily on what I would argue are the weak parts that have been played out in the Ubisoft formula like climbing up towers to synchronize and just doing lots of busy work. There are some traditional sort of you know clear a location and find all the treasures and all that but often they will play out as a little puzzle game like you have to find a way to open a door or lower a ladder or something using your little bloody pet cat. In fact like you can pick up leads in cantinas by listening in on people's conversations but it's not like Assassin's Creed 1 where you'd you know it's a meme at this point where you'd follow people around in these tail missions all you do is lean up against the bar listen to the dialogue and now you've got the mission log entry. So they've cleaned up a lot of that crap and it feels a lot more organic. Unpacking all these systems is a bit of an onion, and I don't know where to start from the bottom or the top. Maybe we'll just start at the top. Let's go broad strokes. Where is this game drawing its sort of inspiration for, for the open world model, is a good question. Because if you're expecting kind of Far Cry reskinned or whatever, that's actually not what's going on here. It's much closer for, and I'm gonna cop heat for the comparison, but this is clearly where their inspiration is, Red Dead Redemption 2. If you're familiar with it, if you've played it, you know, cruising around on a horse, and it's more of an RPG in the sense that it's an action adventure type one, which is less about stat lines and more about enjoying your character, playing dress up a little bit, you know, but but not really about stat lines, not, str not really strictly speaking, then you'll get an idea. Now, I'm not saying that this necessarily holds a candle to Red Dead. I, I don't think anything really can, but it does stand on its own right. And it's good to have more games in whatever that space is, the more action open world. 
I suppose Grand Theft Auto in general is, is probably another good example as well. The overarching plot is just so meh, it doesn't really matter. But you know, in a kind of way, I am thankful for it. I don't particularly care for the, you know, I use the Witcher example of my daughter is in deathly strife and the whole world's going to end. It's like, how the fuck can you do side quests when that is the main motivation? You know, you're going around scrubbing people's pans and clearing monsters out of wells or whatever when the, there's an existential world ending crisis going on. So what's going on over here, the overarching thing, is essentially that you're a young scoundrel-s trying to go out on her own and through a sort of turn of events you've ended up with a broken up sp starship that you want to sort of rebuild and but once you've done that you're evading dudes that are on your tail you've got a thing called a death mark on you which is essentially sort of a system-wide bounty so you do have that on the run impetus behind you and you're trying to set up the heist of a lifetime in true scoundrel overarching plot you essentially need to uh, recruit an expert for each part of your team. God damn it, Rick, you son of a bitch, I'm in. And so when the game, you know, gets you out of the starting world and you've got your ship working with hyperdrive, which, you know, it takes its time. It takes a few hours to get through that. You are essentially let off the leash. There's kind of four main planets that you can jump between. And the way that a planet is constructed it leans, you know, more towards the sort of Mass Effect 2 or Knights of the Old Republic, you know, those kind of Bioware type games of yesteryear, where it's, it's sort of a larger instance that you can play space in. And so within one of these planets, that will consist of a, a fairly open world instance that you cruise around on your speeder bike, like probably a lot bigger than you realize and you really want to get around on your little motorcycle. And that will be dotted around with little busy work tasks to do and missions and hidden things. And that, it's actually quite detailed. There'll be little villages scattered around and there will be like a main hub of scum and villainy, you know, a central cityscape, which would be almost the king's share of the gameplay there. So the idea of sort of cantina hopping around and being in backroom deals, betting on the trots and playing, what is it called, sabac cards and just doing scoundrelly sort of things and setting up smuggling contracts in the cities. This is what's going on. That's the meat and potato of the games. Now, on top of that instance as well, there will be a space section, and that's kind of yet another open world instance in a way, and you'll be going through debris fields or nebulas, and there'll be some space bases you can drop off in some of the instances, but that's the sort of meta construction of the world space. I'll cover the space thing just real quickly while I'm on it, on that level. So space combat plays out a lot like, it reminds me of Everspace a fair bit, Everspace 2, which is a little bit more of a recent popular touchstone, but also uh, Rebel Galaxy Outlaw, which is probably something that a lot of people miss. You remember I play everything, all sorts of indie games. You've got like a chase cam where you can sort of hold down a button to chase dudes in a firefight. It's very effective. It's very cool and engaging and arcadey. Don't get me wrong, it's not some elite dangerous systems management. It's not even as complex as Star Wars Squadrons, which was arguably a dumbed down version of Elite Dangerous. But as far as like an arcade space shooter, you know, repairs during combat, firing lock-on missiles and holding a button to lock on to combat. It's actually really fun and engaging and you can search around debris fields and it really does actually take a big drop of inspiration from Everspace in that there will be mini game puzzles in wrecked spaceships. There'll be like laser walls that you have to try and shoot something to drop the wall. So it'll be about puzzle solving to explore that environment. It works really well as its own thing. And then I suppose to come down a level of the onion, you have your open world space where you cruise around on your, you know, essentially your Red Dead Redemption horse. It's your speeder bike. You can press a button to make it appear next to you. Cruise around. It, look, I had to fiddle with some of the controls. The default mouse controls were terrible, but uh, once I got the hang of it, it worked all right. You don't really fight from horseback, from vehicle back. What you have is this mechanic called adrenaline and it's essentially kind of a more accessible dead eye from Red Dead. And you don't just use it on your bike, but in this instance, the only way to deal with dudes on your bike is that I don't believe you can gunfight from your bike. I'm pretty sure you can't. Right click for me was, you know, mouse the camera around. So essentially you'll end up in a bike chase and as they shoot at you, it builds up the adrenaline meter. And then when that's full, you cash it in to mark the targets and shoot them off your back. So it's kind of dumbed down combat 
but it, it works as well. Dare I say, I, I never really liked fighting from horseback in Red Dead. And if I'm being perfectly honest, I lent onto the dead shot from horseback a bit more. But it's got the trappings you'd expect. You know, you upset the empire, you will get like a wanted rating and they'll chase after you. And look, they're, they're not to be fucked with as well. Just while we're touching on the Empire, they actually play a huge step back in this game. And the Rebels. I've only encountered the Rebels once at the beginning. And I don't want to spoil it, but like part of a bit of a double cross that set you on the path of the game. You do bump into some Rebels and they were fucking insufferable. They were like the cast of the new Saints Row. Like just edgelord bloody Antifa adjacent stand-ins and they're just yuck horrible people and but the Empire itself don't really play a huge menacing presence over you they're there they're present and if you have missions that go up against them or you go into their compounds and upset them they don't fuck around and they'll send death troopers after you which will absolutely demolish you so it's kind of interesting that like the the, the two sort of powers that you'd be used to are there but they kind of take a back seat to the cartels, which I guess we'll go on to next. What, what really makes this game work well is the reputational interplay between the different factions. Uh, essentially, as you do jobs through the course of the main game, almost every time you will be given an opportunity to, you know, commit to the job or double cross or whatever and push reputations up and down accordingly. And they do have repercussions, at least as far as a sort of world building and interaction, as far as a narrative, not really, you know. I was involved in a huge power play coup and I double crossed the changing of the guard, but it didn't really affect anything. The, the clan still was the clan, you know, it didn't make a difference. But, you know, you won't be allowed to go into certain territories and if you really upset some dudes, they will be shoot on sight and they'll send hit teams after you constantly. I decided fuck Crimson Dawn because why not? Everyone needs a villain. And at every possible turn out of just abject spite and malice, I would cross them and I just blew my reputation into the floor. <laughs> I just start shoot on sight nonstop. They hated my guts. Uh, but man, why not? I buddied up close to the Pikes. I don't know much about them, but they seemed all right. I like their leader, this gruff looking dude with half his face ripped off. And they give you some rewards and you know, you get shop discounts and, and more missions from brokers. But look, it affects the game in so far as it, it, it can make you rethink how you go about your, your loyalties, which is cool and it's very thematic being that you're a bounty hunter. Like, are you in it for loyalty? Are you in it for credits? Are you, do you really actually wanna play politics and try and get the different reputations up? Are you like me and you've decided to spitefully hate one faction no matter what and work against them? And it adds a dynamic that's a lot of fun. As far as the moment to moment gameplay goes, there's kind of two layers to that. There's stealth and then there's combat. Now, I am actually quite verbal about how much I dislike stealth in a lot of games. You know, that might be a bit beyond the scope of this video, but broadly speaking, I feel a lot of stealth games lose the thread on what's fun and what's simulation for the point of simulation. But I would say that this is kind of casual stealth. Like it's not full blown immersive sim, but it's very much AAA does stealth. So you will often, you know, be moving into a compound or whatever. And this is where you see some of that DNA from the Far Cry type games coming in. You've got your little sidekick bloody dog cat thing and you can use him to pull switches remotely or distract dudes or just all out attack them and tie them up. And essentially you sneak around and you punch people in the back of head. Now, there's been many memes made about this punching and I agree, it looks fucking stupid from afar, especially if you're just watching trailers trying to figure it out for your own. But what can I say without sounding like I'm carrying water? I, I agree with you. I'm 100% there that it's stupid that you're punching dudes with helmets in their head and knocking them unconscious. It looks dumb. We agree. However, mechanically, it works perfectly. And it's one of those things that as you play and get more into it, like I would almost argue when you're playing a game with your, with your hands on the control, you're not looking at the same things that someone looks at when they watch a YouTube video. You're looking at it through the concerned buyer's scrutiny eye. And I'm looking at it as someone who's, I don't know, looking into the depth at the next target that I'm going to attack or whatever and thinking about the game. There's a level of immersion that makes you kind of not really worry about the whole punching people in the head thing. Again, I'm not trying to carry water or cop out, but what I'm saying is 
I felt your concern watching all the trailers going in and it kind of dissipated once I realized that it, it's just kind of part of the core loop. Now, could they have done something like given her some sort of blackjack or sap, like some sort of weapon to justify it? I think probably, to be honest. And if we're being really honest, maybe don't make her a fucking female character. Maybe make her like a six foot tall, bloody built like a brick shithouse dude. That would make so much sense. And that would address the problem. So yeah, concerns valid, but in motion, sneaking around and knocking people unconscious is really quite fun. You can unlock certain abilities like fast talk. So if people catch you out, you can put your hands up and start buying for time. And then you can quick draw, hit them with like a stun gun, which has a very long cooldown. But what it actually serves as mechanically is a bit of a get out of jail free. If you do get caught while you're stealthing, you will have, you know, Spider-Man gives us one and only one you will have a one chance to get out of it. And it's very generous and very cool and it works very, very well. However, when you do eventually go loud, that's when you get into the gunplay and the gunplay is fucking cool. There's no other way to put it. It is really, really fun. You pretty much just have a pistol and it is going for a space cowboy, scrappy pistolero fighting style and it nails it. It really feels dynamically fun. It kind of feels like the compilations that you see of people taking down a Far Cry outpost. You know, they'll execute a dude, then throw a knife and then pull out his pistol and shoot and then slide down a thing. And, you know, this sort of dynamism in the moment gameplay, this actually grasps it, albeit at a more stupid person level, at my level. I'm not someone that's going to try and 100% a Far Cry outpost, but you can do it here. But you still get that kind of fun cinematic power trip when you gunfight here. You hip fire your gun a lot. There is sort of a, a slight zoom, right click, not ADS, but zoom, but you're not gonna use that quite as much. You essentially just mag dump with a flurry of bullets, and then you have like an active reload thing that you can do to cool down your gun. You have infinite ammo. You do have some gadgets like uh, you can change your gun to fight like electricity, but that's more for puzzles or killing certain enemies that have shields. But you're generally sliding from cover to cover, shooting away, throwing a punch in. It actually kind of feels like the scrappy, you could say hand solo combat, but it's almost Harrison Ford combat, right? Because it kind of feels a bit Indiana Jones in this Lucas film of old cinematic you know, bloodless violence that's more sort of fantastical, swashbuckly, scoundrel type stuff. And that's how it feels. I can't sing my praises high enough about it, but just know that, that that's the core loop between stealth, which works really well, and gunplay, which works great when you eventually have to go loud or you have four scenarios where you just have to go loud. But it's really fun. And that's that's all that matters. And honestly, it was kind of surprising how much I loved it. I don't know, I suppose the last layer is, you know, the, the dog cat thing. He's, he is quite cute for sure, but he's functional as well. You can get him to open doors, set off bombs, all sorts of stuff. You can upgrade your skill sets as you go along, but he's a good complement as far as gameplay and it's all implemented perfectly well. Oh, and at the, at the bottom of the gameplay chain, you know, getting to the bottom of my onion that's going forever, you have two sort of mini games. You have door locks, which you open. She's got like a little lock pick thing and it's this rhythm based, I don't know how else to describe it, but it works really, really well. It actually changes it up because I think lock picking is the most fucking yawn mini game ever in a lot of these games. And it's never been changed for bloody 10 years. Everyone does the same lock picking mini game. So this has a different mini game, which is rhythm based. It'll be a mixture of ticks and boops to put you into a rhythm state. So the tick is sort of a bar reference, tick, tick, tick sort of thing. And there'll be beep, a beep, beep, a beep a beep beep and then you'll just listen to it on its sort of four beat bar cycle and then you just have to slap the rhythm back into it as a call and answer i sound like an idiot explaining it but in practice it actually works really well and it's a very welcome change and then you've got hacking terminals the same thing it boring as fuck in every version that they do for the last however many years but this has a system kind of like Mastermind, which is a board game of yesteryear that you'd play growing up. I don't know how else to describe it, but it's good. I like it a lot. Actually, you know what? I think one of the Fallout Terminal hack games had something similar, maybe with a hidden letter mechanic. Actually, now that I think about it, it might be closer to something like that, like Fallout 3 Terminal hacking, but it's been a long time. Okay, that's the gameplay from top to bottom, and I've been very thorough with it. 
I will point out that the way that you get abilities in this game is very clever and unique. There will be sort of specialist, let's call them like premium side quests. And you'll go and you'll befriend said person and they will give you a suite of upgrades and they will have requirements associated with them to unlock. For example, the smooth talking thing I was talking about, if someone sees you stealthing, you don't have that by default. You have that by meeting the expert, befriending them, accepting the requirements, which will be something like, I don't know, break into X boxes or pat Nick six different times or something like that. So it's, it's a very clever way to engage with side quests and to outsource character development mechanically. So it's not just follow the main quest, it's more stop doing the main quest to go and unlock smoke bombs because you have to do that by learning how to do it off of uh, a side quest character. Again, a lot of really clever ways to change up the traditional formula. And then of course there's the sort of gambling mini games where you can bet on horses and I, I, I'll do that until the machine tells me I'm not allowed to do it anymore and you can find inside info on rigged races and then there's a sabac card game which is kind of like a Texas hole them two two card pickup kind of kind of game it works it's cool it's fun um it's all quite addicting but yeah i think all in all that's pretty much how the game works this video is turning out to be very very long but i will as promised point out some glaring negatives there's something wrong with aspects of the graphics and it's not my hardware i'm certain of it i've tried all different settings and i'm, I'm running pretty much max you know i'm on a 40 series i don't have my stat sheet in front of me but this shouldn't be an issue and the fact that a lot of this this game looks brilliant. It is by Massive on the Snowdrop engine, and Avatar is one of the most beautiful games I've ever played ever, whether you like that or not, it's still true. And this has aspects of that in the environment. You can kind of see it. You can see it coming across. So you'll be cruising along in your speeder, or you'll be going through like a, a debris field in space, and it looks like a million bucks. It looks like the most beautiful game you've ever played in these moments. However, like I said, there's something wrong with the textures for whatever reason, uh, for like rusted out metal pieces. And unfortunately, a lot of these texture packs or models or whatever are used in star bases and cities and that sort of thing. So it becomes quite glaring having arguably some of the best graphics in current day superimposed against something really weird with muddy washed out scrubby stuff and then you add in the the human face models there's been much made about this about whether they're uglifying women on purpose that may be true because we've got another point we'll get to after this but what is actually much more probably likely is whatever machine they're putting the fucking face models through that's broken as anything every human face looks gross and garbage and crap and you know look light spoiler but apparently she's shown in the trailers the amelia clark character from han solo had popped up for a quick sort of cameo so you know you can superimpose her face against the actress she's based off of and while they put some makeup on her arguably um, an attempt to make her prettier than the main character she still looks like hot garbage as well so i don't know if it's necessarily that they're trying to uglify the main character as such but I just think for whatever reason, the, the devs have become colorblind to the issues with their own in engine, or maybe they're just gonna launch it and not address it, who knows? And then when you stand this against the alien faces, you know, you've got the Greedo species, uh, you know, the bum face ape alien type dudes, and then you've got those, those guys that Lando had a co-pilot. You know, they kind of look like they're wearing a face over the top of their face, but these dudes, all look one-to-one -one from the, you know, 70s prosthetics of the era. They look so good. And if anything, that just makes the human face models look even more shit. So I don't know what to tell you. However, and I've, I've left the best till last. I'm not trying to hide it away or anything like that. I'm just, there's so much to cover. And this video is already too long. Here's the thing that everyone's going to miss that none of the bought reviewers will tell you and arguably this will affect the people the most concerned about controversies the force is definitely female at first i thought hmm this could be happenstance but it went from that to coincidence to very overt almost gaslighting i reckon at this point 75 percent to 80 percent of all the main characters that i've encountered you know from side quest stories anyone anyone of any significance is female it's actually kind of jarringly obvious that they are doing some weird 
revisionist female stacking. And every single one of them as a rule, and perhaps bar an exception of one or two, all have these sort of bull dyke boy cut haircuts, and they're all trying to be a, a hard woman in a man's world, and it kind of gets so boring. Very try hard. So it's actually quite, it's kind of eye rolling and it, you know, it makes me think, you know, to illustrate it with a facetious example, if you made a Wakanda Forever type game and you replaced 50% of all the characters in that with white dudes, but you never addressed it, you never said anything, people are going to be going there thinking, why? Why would you do this? What was the point? You're clearly doing some sort of revisionist take on the original material. And yeah, I'll admit Star Wars isn't some bloody, some Shakespearean text of literature or Greek tragedies of the ancient era, but you can't deny that it's a pretty big cornerstone of Americana and cinematic history. And I, I think it's kind of fucking weird and piss weak to sort of just repopulate it so overtly and pretend like people aren't going to notice it. I don't know why, but there's female stormtroopers voice lining in that, and I'm pretty sure none of the original trilogy had any of that crap. And it kind of makes me think, you did such a wonderful job with so much of this game, why the fuck did you do this? Because it's glaringly, obviously, something that stands apart. And then you couple this with the main character. Now look, I'm kind of thankful that the main character is a bit of an everyman, Jerry Seinfeld, bland, kind of boring character, right? She's not hyper controversial. And to be perfectly honest, this game isn't doing like woke rhetoric or anything like that. It's not browbeating. There have been some moments of introspection between her and like the robot character you pick up about fighting for causes and how neither of them are really uh, interested. So the game, in, in its defense, it actually seems to go out of its way to try and be lukewarm on this stuff and not try and push some angle or agenda. And that's wonderful. But the, the main character feels like a self-insert, but in the most earnest, honest, and kind of tragic way. A lot of self-inserts in writing that you see seem to be a sort of glorified version. Be like if I did a self-insert of myself, but I made him look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? I think you get the example. This feels like a self-insert of uh, essentially, I suppose you would call it like a female incel. She's mumbly and kind of one dimensional in the way that she's voice acted. And she just feels like a real kind of beta kind of loser person that you would, if you didn't actually feel sorry for how tragic a person they were, you'd kind of laugh at them. It sounds very, very cruel, but I, I feel like whoever was in charge of directing this character has put themselves in it, and no one had the fucking heart to tell him that no one wants to be this loser character. So in a way, in, in, <laughs> in her female beta persona, she's kind of non-offensive, and so it all blends into the background noise, and you end up with a character that is, is so low impact that she's kind of agreeable as a main character, almost Gordon Freeman-esque. She attempts to be smart ass and, and tries to channel the, the Harrison Ford roguish, cheeky personality, and it just doesn't land. And I can't tell you whether that's the direction or the voice actress. It might actually be, in all honest truth, that the voice actress is mediocre, but that might actually be a blessing because normally you would get a tough, gruff, over-the-top, compensating female to push this kind of writing. And my God, I'm thankful that that's not what's going on here. Anyway, all in all, I really like it. I really enjoyed it and I will try and find more time to play more of it. And look, I'm sorry if this doesn't agree with your worldview or your position or, you know, I like Scarlet, but you know, no, you should just like the fact that I'm honest about fucking everything. All right. Now, we can disagree. That's fine. In fact, that's kind of important. But remember, I'm not your enemy. I might be the only friend that you've got in this bloody space. All these companies keep trying to send me friggin' toys and models and bloody, you know, $200 sculptures to put on me mantelpiece. I don't want any of this crap. I don't want to be indebted. All I want to do is play good games and share them with good people. So be one of the good ones. Accept that what I tell you is from the heart and honest and it's only to inform. And God help us because I'll be covering Sh Assassin's Creed Shadows and that one I am legitimately worried about. Anyway team, might just leave it there for the time being and I'll catch you guys on the next one.